it's Kate, and this is the fifth and final video for week one of Math 23. Alright, so we've talked about function inverses, and now we'd like to take a moment and talk a little bit about matrix inverses. First of all, if you have a non-square matrix A, an M by N matrix where M and N are not equal, then the matrix can have a one-sided inverse, which basically means that it returns the identity function if it's multiplied on a particular side of that matrix. Remember that matrix multiplication is not commutative, so the side on which you multiply does matter. Okay, the two situations are if M is greater than N. So that basically means if the number of rows is greater than the number of columns. So if the number of rows is greater than the number of columns, then the matrix takes a vector in Rn, which is shorter than the vector it produces, which is a longer vector in Rm. So in general, there will be a lot of different matrices that you can multiply that longer vector by and return that shorter vector because remember that's what inverses do when you compose these two functions. When you have a, one function act on a vector and then have the inverse function act on it, it should return that original vector. So that inverse should be returning our original shorter vector and you'll find that if you have more rows than columns you'll have a lot of matrices that are able to return that vector. So in that case, we have a lot of what we call left inverses, right, when the inverse function goes second. And remember, if we're multiplying by vectors, the vector is going to be on the right, and so it encounters A first and then B second. So that's how order sort of works there. We'll review that a lot in this class. But there will be a ton of left inverses. There will be no right inverse. And vice versa, if you have fewer rows than columns, if M is less than N, then what the matrix A is doing is it takes a vector in Rn and it makes a shorter vector in Rm. So in general there will be no left inverse, but there will be several right inverses. And we will actually go into great detail about why this is happening later in the course. It will be one of the things that you'll probably be able to prove in a few weeks. So for a square matrix, it's possible for both a right inverse and a left inverse to exist. So we're looking at when M and N are equal, when the number of rows and the number of columns is the same. So we can prove that the right inverse, which we'll call B, and the left inverse, which we'll call C, are equal and that they are unique. And unique is an interesting term. I'm actually going to circle it here. In this case, what it means for a matrix to have a unique inverse, well, that means that it only has one. And that inverse is unique to that matrix. So that is that matrix's inverse. So if you had two students in a course that said, I found the inverse to this square matrix, and the other student will says, well, I found the inverse to this square matrix, if they turned their papers to each other, they would have the same inverse. They would have calculated the exact same thing. All right. Usually we denote this very, very similarly to our function notation and it looks like this. It looks like a to the negative one. It does not actually mean a to the negative one. It means the inverse matrix. It means that if you took the square matrix a and multiplied it by inverse on either side, it would return the identity matrix, which is a matrix full of zeros, except for along the diagonal from top left to bottom right, there are ones. All right, and let's take a look here. Here's a quick recipe. Later in the course, we will talk in great length about how to find uh, the inverse of much larger matrices, but for two by two matrices whose determinant is not zero, because look at what would happen in this uh, recipe if we had a zero determinant we have to multiply by one over the determinant, so that's undefined if the determinant's zero. But if we have the inverse of a two by two matrix A whose determinant is not zero, here's our formula. We calculate the determinant of A and we multiply this entire thing by one over the determinant of A, and then this entire matrix right here, this two by two, has very similar entries to A but slightly modified. The entries along the main diagonal are swapped. Remember that A had A up here and D here. Well, D is now here and A is here. And then the entries along the off diagonal, the opposite diagonal, they are don't change position, but they are multiplied by negative 1. 
So rewritten, substituting in our recipe for the determinant, it's 1 over AD minus BC, and then with the swapped entries. All right, moving on. Our next topic is matrix transposes. The transpose of a given matrix, A, is written A, and there's a superscript here, capital T, and that corresponds to the transpose of the matrix A. The two are very closely related, and in fact what happens is that the rows of A end up being the columns of A transpose, and the columns of A end up being the rows of A transpose. Square matrices are not the only matrices that have transposes. Non-square matrices can have transposes too. They will have swapped dimensions. If it was a 2 by 3 matrix, it's now a 3 by 2 matrix because the number of rows and columns are switching. But here's a look at what happens in a square example. Here we have A with A, B, C, D. Well, the first row was A, B, and now in the transpose, the first column is A, B. Second row in the original matrix was CD. Well, now the second column in the transpose is CD. And there are some interesting properties that transposes have. One of them is that the transpose of a matrix product is the product of the transposes, but in the opposite order. So if we took AB and that product and took that product's transpose, that would be the same thing as if we swapped the order and took the transposes and then multiplied them together. So AB transpose is equal to B transpose times A transpose. And as we investigate these types of properties in sample problems, in small group problems, and on your homework, you'll find that that sigma notation that we use to describe matrix multiplication comes in handy a great deal here. A similar rule holds for matrix inverses where AB inverse, the product of A and B, that inverse, is equal to if we inverted B and then multiplied it by the inverse of A. So what good does matrix multiplication do? Well, it has a lot of applications. Let's move down here to 1.11, our final topic. Our first application is in counting paths. And this is part of the study of a field called graph theory. We'll do a few more examples like this in the sample problems and the small group problems. But what's great about this is that matrices and matrix multiplication allow problems that seem very complicated to be rather straightforwardly simplified. So suppose we have four islands. They are islands 1, 2, 3, and 4. And they're connected by ferry routes. You can see these vectors on here and the arrowheads. And so what we do is when we're asked, OK, well, after n numbers of ferry rides, how many different ways are there to reach one particular island from another? That seems almost impossible at first. Here's how you do it. We want to construct this matrix that has some information about this setup in it. Well, what's interesting is in this column, we are concerned only in our minds with island 1. And in this position, I want to write how many ways can I get to island 1 with one ferry ride? Well, there are no loops here. There's no way for me to take a ferry from island 1 to island 1, so it's just 0. In this position, I want to know how many ways are there for me to get from island 1 to island 2 with one ferry ride, well, there's one way. It just goes like that. For island three, there is also one way, this side here. For island four, there are zero ways. I know you're going to have to zoom very closely, but there is actually no arrowhead on the vector from one to four. The arrowhead is on this side of the vector from four to one. And so here's the next column. This corresponds only to island two. Note that island two only goes from island 2 to island 4 with a single ferry ride. So there are zero ways to get from island 2 to island 1 in one ferry ride. There are zero ways to get from island 2 to island 2 in one ferry ride. There are zero ways to get from island 2 to island 3 in one ferry ride. There's one way to get to island 4. Now this column is island 3. So you want to say in one ferry ride, how many ways are there for me to get from island 3 to island 1? Well, there is an arrowhead on the end here, so there's one way there. Uh, there's no ways to get from island 3 to island 2 in one ferry ride. There are also no ways to get from island 3 to island 3, and there's one way to get from island 3 to island 4. We can see that arrowhead down here. And then island 4 is this final column. There is one way to get from island 4 to island 1 in one ferry ride, but there are no ways, none of the arrows are pointing out 
of island 4 to any other island, including itself. So the rest of these are 0. So that's how you construct this matrix. So this is, has all that information in there. And so what we do, if we take this matrix and raise it to the nth power, say we're asked, OK, after three ferry rides, how many ways are there to get from island 1 to island 3? All we have to do is take this matrix A and raise it to the third power. Literally multiply it by itself three times. And then we take a look at that whatever number is in the location of from island 1 to island 3. And that will give us the answer for how many ways there are to reach island 3 from island 1 by a sequence of n ferry rides. All right. Another interesting application of matrix multiplication is called a Markov process. Sometimes people have called these iterated processes. I've heard that jargon thrown around. Um, perhaps you've seen these in math classes past. Basically, when we have a high repetition of a process done over and over and over again. Here's an example. We have a game of beach volleyball that has two states. So in state, state one is team one is serving, and in state two, team two is serving. With each point that is played, there is a state transition governed by probabilities. So what does that mean? That means if team one is serving, then in the next serve, either team one could still be serving or team two could be serving because team one has lost the ball. And really that kind of depends on how good team one is at serving. But let's take a look at this example. So for example, from state one, there's a probability of 0.8 of remaining in state one. So if state one is serving right now, there's a chance that 80% chance that team one will be serving the next point. There's a 20% chance that team two will be serving the next point. Let's look at this matrix right here and see how it's set up. State 1 right now corresponds to this column. State 2 right now corresponds to this column. And here are the probabilities that at the next point state 1 will occur and at the next point state 2 will occur. So here this is saying state 1 is occurring right now. That means team 1 is serving. So here is the probability that for the next point team 1 will be serving. Here is the probability that for the next point, team two will be serving. And we haven't included this information, but you can take a moment and think to yourself, what does this mean? This column means that if team two is serving right now, the probability that team one will be serving the next point is 30%, and the probability that team two will be serving the next point is 70%. So which team is better? Well, that's an irrelevant question, but it seems like Team 1 is a little bit better. Team 1 has about an 80% chance that they will continue serving when they're serving, and Team 2 has about a 70% chance that they will continue serving. So what use is this matrix? What does this tell us? Well, note that it says the matrix A to the N, A raised to the nth power, specifies the transition probabilities that result from playing N consecutive points. So if I said... If team one starts with the ball, what's the probability that after 10 consecutive points, they will still be serving, they will still have the ball? You could take this matrix A, raise it to the 10th power, and then the if team one starts with the ball narrows us down to this column, and then what is the probability that team one will be serving? It's right here in this probability. We'll do several examples like this. Um, in our sample problems, in our small group problems. But this is two of the major applications of matrix multiplication that take things that seem pretty complicated to compute and turn them into pretty straightforward problems. That's the end of the fifth video and all of the videos for week one of Math 23.